good morning. It's good to have everyone with us this morning. It's good to be back amongst you again. So um, good to see everyone this morning. Don't forget to pass the cue pads, please. A um, couple of announcements as we head into our week. This after tonight, 6 o'clock, beer and hymns over at the Eilis House at 6 o'clock. Make sure to bring a chair to sit in, your favorite beverage to drink, um, a snack to share, not a, not a not potluck food food, but a snack to share, and then um, a sweat of your voice. So come and we will have beer and hymns again in the um, Eilis backyard. It will be fun, so please come and join us for that. Also, um, just an update on the feed. Our children, I know there's an announcement in the back um, of the bulletin of the needs that, they're, that are, they're seeking right now, but I saw on Facebook this morning, Angie posted, they need fruit cups, granola bars, and brown lunch bags, and then Ziploc, snack size Ziploc bags. So if you're out and about um, and are so inclined, fruit cups, granola bars, brown lunch bags, and snack size Ziploc bags. Um, also, hard to believe, but the corn roast is coming um, sooner than we think. Um, we're looking at Wednesday, August 9th, second Wednesday of August. Um, so next week we should have some sign-ups um, for you to be able to be a part of that. So corn roast coming Wednesday, probably August 9th. Watch for those details. Um, and then I think the last thing is we had a prayer request for a Robert who is, has connections with the congregation and is requesting our prayers. So we will keep Robert in our prayers um, as we worship today. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and we will begin worship. We begin on page 211 in the front of the hymnal for confession and forgiveness. As you are comfortable, would you please rise? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who was rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The opening hymn is number 434, 434.
page 213. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebecca and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Be'er Lehi Roy and was settled in the Negev. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up, he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you are comfortable, would you please rise for the gospel application? We started Beer and Hymns a number of years ago in, in uh, 2017 in the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. I thought that was kind of a neat way to, to celebrate Reformation stuff, especially because Martin Luther was an excellent brewmaster. I mean, he, he brewed beer. It was something very, many people did, in part because the water wasn't always safe to drink. Um, I, I stumbled across an interesting story about that just yesterday, in fact. I don't know the truth of it, but it was on the internet, so it must be right. It must be true, right? <laughs> So the story is that in the time of the Reformation, um, the, the ingredients for beer were grown widely, but they were also heavily taxed by the church, because the church owned much of the land. And of course, Luther, being at odds with the established church at that time, was not interested in supporting the church with the tax monies. And so he and the other reformers tried to figure out what to do about that. And, and according to the story, what they did is they decided to change the ingredients in beer and instead to use a weed growing in the fields that could be gathered at no cost. And the name of the weed, hops. Supposedly that's how hops became the backbone of beer. I don't know, that's what they say. Now, um, that has very little to do with my sermon, so let me go to my sermon. <laughs> but, but seriously, do join us for beer and hymns because it really is a, a fun time and, and uh, we just sing hymns. We just sing hymns, just sing lots of hymns and have a good time. And, and the Ilifs have said, their neighbors, every time we've done that, what's going on over your place? There's, they hear all these hymns being sung. That's kind of cool. So we were just returned for our vacation trip. We went out to, um, uh, one of the places we went to was North Carolina. We went to the Outer Banks. And as we got into the Outer Banks of North Carolina, we, uh, we turned south from the exit, and we stopped at the Bodie Island Visitor Center, which is right by the Bodie Island um, Lighthouse. We wanted to see the lighthouse, and we, and we went into the Visitor Center. We started talking with the ranger, and the ranger showed us some uh, large turtle shells. I mean, these things are big turtles, the sea turtles, you know, those big, big sea turtle shells. And she told us what, what they do, and this is really fascinating to me, that the turtles, you know, at this time of the year, they're laying their eggs, and so they will come up in the middle of the night, they will come up onto the beach, come up maybe, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 feet away from the water's edge, and they will lay the eggs and bury them in a, in a small little um, nest in the sand, and then return to the water. Um, 
And then she said that, um, she said, there are members of our staff, she said, fortunately, I'm not one of them. There are members of our staff who go out at 5 a.m. every morning in their little dune buggies, and they go along the beach, and they look for the tracks of the turtle. And when they see the tracks, they follow the tracks to where the nest is, and they dig up the nest to, number one, to count the eggs. Number two, if the nest is not viable, if they determine that the, this nest will not survive because of its location, they will move the, the eggs to a place where they will be viable. And then number three, they put kind of like a little fencing or a, 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 an enclosure around it with a big sign that says, do not touch under penalty of extreme terrible things happening to you. So uh, in order to protect those eggs. And, and I think that was a really interesting story. So we continued on after we, we left the, the lighthouse. We went on down and we, we checked into our, our motel and um, went out to dinner. Came back and, and strolled the beach that evening, um, doing a little beach combing, looking for shells. The next day, we went out and did the touristy type stuff. Came back in the evening and again went out to the beach area. Only this time, within a hundred yards of the building we were staying in, there is one of those enclosures. It was not there the night before. One of those enclosures protecting the eggs was there. And you looked down the beach and we saw five or six more further down the beach. What that meant was that as we had slept the night before, within a hundred yards of where we were sleeping, the turtles came ashore and laid their eggs. God makes promises. And one of the promises that God has made to us is the establishment, the nurture, the maintenance, and the sustenance of life. I mean, sometimes take that for granted that, that, you know, we just live our lives and life goes on, but nothing happens without God at work in the midst of this world. Turtles come ashore to lay their eggs on a regular basis because that is part of the cycle of life. And while it may not be, seem all that significant because, you know, giant sea turtles don't immediately make a lot of difference to me in my life, they become, in a sense, a representative of this greater cycle of life in which we find ourselves, where trees drop seeds that begin to grow and grow the new forest, where plants come up. We were, we were on a trail. We were on a trail in Virginia on, uh, off of... I think, it was the Blue, I think it was on the Blue Ridge, no, Shen it was the uh, Skyline Drive in the Shenandoah National Park. And we're doing this trail, and we kept seeing this plant that looked kind of familiar, and we finally realized, that's rhubarb. What's rhubarb doing on a mountain trail? And the answer was, one t at one time, that had been a place where people had lived. And this is the leftover from rhubarb that had been planted maybe a hundred years ago. It's still there, the cycle of life continuing. And God's promise of to nurture life continuing to be fulfilled by a good and a gracious God. The sense of, of, of fulfillment of promise is what's going on in this story about Rebecca as a wife for Isaac. Because God had made a promise about, oh, I don't know, I'm doing the math, probably 50 or 60 years before this story occurs. He went to Abraham and he said, you will be the father of a great nation. The very beginning of the gathering of the people of Israel. And Abraham said, seriously, I'm like 80, 90 years old and my wife is about the same. And we have no children, no heirs. God said, don't worry. I made the promise. I will make it happen. And he did the birth of Isaac. But now Sarah has died. And Isaac's, you know, he's getting started. He's pushing 40 and he's still single. He needs, he needs a wife. Because God made the promise to Abraham, and that promise to Abraham is carried on in that family. Abraham to, to Isaac to Jacob, and then on. But nothing happens without the mother. It's not just about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's also about Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah. In order for God's promise to be kept, God has to make something happen here. And God does. The story, as you read the story, you could almost, you, know, you could take, you could almost pretend or imagine God is not even there. 
And yet, it is acknowledged right there in the middle of the story that God is a part of this, that God has made this happen, that God is making good on the promise that God had made long, long ago. And that's what we affirm as faithful disciples of Jesus, as a community of faith. Not infrequently, not every time, but not infrequently when, I, when I'm in, in doing a, a funeral sermon. I will lift that up. I will lift up that promises were made to the person whom we are remembering in this font or a font like it. Promises made many, many years ago, but promises which God has never forgotten and which now God has redeemed as God has welcomed this servant into eternal life. That we live on the basis of the promises that God makes to us all the way back in the beginning. Promises that God does not forget. Promises about the nurture of life. Yes, the sea turtles and the trees and all the other stuff too, the rhubarb. But even more than that, the simple presence of a good and gracious God in the person of the crucified and risen Jesus, bringing us life and hope in the midst of a really crazy, nutty world. Promises made, promises kept by a good and gracious God. Just as God promises to maintain life and deliver us with the sea turtles crawling up the beach, God promises to maintain our life in that level and a deeper level in the person of the crucified and risen Jesus. But there is more to the story. Remember what I said. The sea turtles come up and they lay their eggs. Then these People come at 5 o'clock in the morning and they, they fence it off in order to, to uh, ensure its survival. God works in our world, but God does not work alone. God chooses to use our hands. And so we see that then in the story of, of Rebecca being brought forth as a wife for Isaac. We see that in the person of Rebecca herself, who's kind of a feisty character. I mean, you know, here's a person who, who I, it's kind of an interesting thing in the story. The, the part of the story we didn't read tells us that um, the servant, Abraham's servant, had 10 camels. Now remember what he says. He says, he comes to the spring of water and he says, okay, God, here's what I'm going to do. I want you to make this happen, that some young woman is going to come out and I'm going to ask her for a drink of water. And if she offers me a drink and offers to water my camels, then she must be the right one. There are 10 camels. Camels drink an average of 20 to 30 gallons of water. Do the math, folks. She's going to haul two to 300 gallons of water to offering. She's offering to do that. I mean, this is, a, this is one heck of a farm girl here. I mean, she, she knows what she's, she's got it. Um, and then, and then later on in the story, when they ask her, are you willing to go with this man to some guy you've never met? Remember, arranged marriages, that's true. But still, she says, I will. Rebecca is a part of making this story happen. But also, an unnamed servant. I mean, the servant, this, this servant is the primary character in this 24th chapter. He's the one making things happen, or rather I should say, making things happen as God works through him. And he doesn't even have a name. Rebecca's feistiness and unnamed servant's faithfulness make the story happen. Just like people make it happen with sea turtles, and you and I have the opportunity to make it happen in our world. You and I have the opportunity, the privilege, the, the, the awesome task of being a part of what God is doing in the midst of a very hurting and broken world. And as we go out and we seek to continue to proclaim that promise, to proclaim the promise and to lift up, to witness to the fulfillment of God's promises, that God has not abandoned this world, that God has not abandoned his people, that God has not decided that the world doesn't matter anymore. And as we bring that message of hope, we do so as God's servants. Sometimes with a bit of feistiness, perhaps, and many times with faithfulness or even anonymity. And we just do things that nobody notices, that don't bring attention. 
but we seek to be a part of what God is doing so that we can continue to proclaim to the world that God is at work. And in the context, in the confidence that God is at work, we can also hear the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. Come to me, because God is at work. And in the person of Jesus, God is making good promises of life and hope even in challenging times. God is making good the promise of life. Amen. We continue with the singing of hymn number 777. Hymn number 777. As you're comfortable, would you please rise?
the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. God of covenant, we call ministers to proclaim the gospel of grace throughout the world. In spite of pastors, deacons, church musicians, and all ministers of your word as they carry out your work. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all creation, you reveal your goodness to all who have made, rivers and seas, plants and animals, and endangered species. You prosper the work of conservation organizations, botanical gardens, zoos, and wildlife sanctuaries. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of the nations, you desire that all peoples of the world live in peace. Guide government leaders at all levels, national, state, province, and local, to work for justice, mercy, and reconciliation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of compassion, you bring healing to those who are sick, consolation to those who are grieving, and well-being to those who are distraught. Send skilled caregivers to all in need, and make your presence known among all who suffer. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of rejoicing, we have brought us together this day to worship around the word and sacrament. Encourage children that are learning and growing, and watch over those who are absent today. Lead us all to places of earth, renewal and refreshment. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of presence, you are with us in our times of need, sending your healing and restoring us to wholeness. Be with Robert, Rose, and Diane. Walk with them during their time of need and fill them with your peace and hope. Hear us, O God. Remember, she is great. God of all faithfulness, through the witness of the faithful departed, you reveal your mansion. hold us. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace with one another. Sometimes 
sneak up to her. I say, Linda's going to, are you going to flag her down, Linda, or are you going to come on? <laughs> thank, thank you both. And anybody else who wants to sneak up now, Linda, please do so. Okay, back to baptism, though. As Lutherans, we understand baptism to be a sacrament whereby God reaches out and publicly claims us. We are marked as children of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and sent forth as disciples of Jesus. There's a lot going on in baptism. But in baptism, God is at work, not us. Baptism is a gift of grace. It is not our response. It is God's doing in us that matters. To be sure, faith is important. In faith, we trust the central promise of baptism that the death of Jesus is the gift of life for us. Our faith, however, is not what makes it all work. God does. God makes it work. And our Savior's baptism ministry focuses on welcoming the baptized into the body of Christ and into the community of faith. We begin by preparing for baptism. One of the pastors meets with the family and is old enough the one to be baptized. We discuss the baptism, what it means and how it happens, but most of all, we stress God is at work. The baptism itself is normally in the context of worship, surrounded by the community of faith. The word is proclaimed, the water is splashed over the head three times. And then we gift the baptized child of God with a blanket or a prayer shawl, a reminder that we are wrapped in both the prayers of the community and the embrace of loving God. Younger children will receive a story Bible, and if older children don't have a Bible, we find one that's appropriate for them. Finally, the baptized is blessed by the congregation as a new disciple of Jesus. And then the journey of faith begins. So thank you for your financial support to this congregation that makes this ministry possible. Your gifts enable us to welcome children and, adult and adults in a way that affirms their place as a child of God and as a part of this community of faith in the midst of all that God is doing in our world. We continue with the Canticle of Thanksgiving on page 219 in the front of the hymnal. As you are comfortable, would you please rise? <laughs> until he comes. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Please join me in the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All people are called to Christ's table. Come, eat what is good. As we partake in communion, please note that we have gluten-free wafers in addition to the regular wafers and grape juice in addition to the wine. If you have need of that, please just let us know as you come forward and we will gladly share that with you. As we do communion, we'll sing Lamb of God and then also the communion hymn is day by day. Come for all is ready. Please be seated. Thank you. 